If you thought I was gonna make it through 2021 without talking about Pi, boy, were you wrong! <laughs> Hi, I'm Erin Jean McDowell, and welcome to this episode of Bake It Up A Notch. This episode is all about savory pies. We're gonna be talking about all the methods you need to know, tons of places where you can get creative. Of course, we're gonna talk about equipment, where things could go wrong, and when possible, how to fix them. It's gonna be an incredibly delicious episode, and if it sounds like something you're going to enjoy, please do me a favor, click like and subscribe so you can be made aware of all new episodes as they become available. With that said, let's get baking. We talked about all the equipment you're going to need in the very first episode of the Pie Crust Spectacular. The only thing I wanna point out in this savory pie episode is that when it comes to savory pies, I definitely like to think outside of a traditional pie plate. I bake a lot of savory pies in skillets and other baking pans, things like nine by 13, nine by nines, casserole dishes, sheet trays. I really like to use a lot of different things because sometimes we're bringing this pie to the dinner table or the lunch table or whatever. So I definitely like to think of different sizes for serving a crowd and things like that. But if you want a primer on all the equipment you're gonna need, go back to that dough and crust episode for everything you need to know. Let's talk about crusts you should know. Now, I typically make my plain all butter pie dough. I don't put sugar in it. So that means that you can use my plain all butter dough for savory pies just as well as you can use them for sweet. But I also think that there are some different crusts worth mentioning that really have some special things as it pertains to savory pies. The first is my rough puff. My rough puff pastry is so easy to make and produces a really flaky, shattery, tender, tender crust that gets beautifully golden. And best of all, it's really nice and supportive. It works great for freeform pies, and that's one of the reasons that I love it so much when making savory pies. We talk about how to make it in the puff pastry episode of Bake It Up A Notch, which was our very first episode ever. That's how much I love this rough puff, guys. It was the very first thing I had to talk to you about. Next up, let's talk about pat brise. This is, in my opinion, one of the easier crusts out there because most methods utilize the food processor. This means that you can do a great job of making this crust, whether you have warmer hands, whether you have cooler hands, and if you struggle with making pie crust, this is a great way to go. In a pat brise recipe, the fat is incorporated a little bit more fully. It's uh, in very small pieces throughout. This yields a crust that is still really, really tender and it has a little bit of flake, but it also boasts a lot of sturdiness and is really, really easy to work with and handle kind of at every stage of the game. Now, I've had some questions about this because this recipe appears in my book um, right alongside the all butter pastry dough. And in the book and in this recipe here on Food 52, I use less water for pat brise typically than I do for a standard all butter dough. The reason for that is because we're incorporating the fat more fully, that some of the flour is becoming partially hydrated from the incorporation of that fat. So it's not necessarily a golden rule that you're always going to use less, but typically you do need less moisture to bring a pat brise together because that fat has been incorporated more fully. So the recipe calls for three tablespoons or about 45 grams of ice water. And then we'll pulse that and see where we are hydration wise. Let's give it a pulse. And the goal here is basically to just pulse it until the dough comes together. We want it to kind of almost form a ball around the blade. It's happening, here we go, are you ready? <laughs> okay. So just like all pie and pastry dough, when it comes together, it should come together into a ball, but it doesn't necessarily need to be totally smooth. There can be kind of some visible cracks, and it also should not be super sticky to the touch. I wanna be honest with you guys, it is a little bit warm in the Bake It Up A Notch kitchen today. We don't have any air conditioning today. So as a result, this is already starting to get a little bit soft and sticky. It's totally fine, there's no mistake here yet. 
We just need to get it right into the fridge right away. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in the fridge and I'll bring you back one that's already been in the fridge to show you what this dough looks like after it has cooled down. Cooled down, chilled out, much better. So as you can see, when I stick my hand onto the pastry dough and pull it up, it's not sticky. The dough is um, gonna be perfect for rolling out right from this stage. What I love most about Pat Brise as a dough is that if you're kind of afraid of making pastry dough, I think it's a really good place to start. If you don't have a food processor, you can also mix the fat in by hand. Just remember, you're really incorporating it maybe more than you're used to with other recipes that you've made in the past. And this dough just turns out really, really reliably tender and flaky. So it may not give you the crazy flake of like the rough puff pastry and some of the other ones that I'm always kind of touting about, but it gives a really nice sturdy crust. It's nice and tender, really buttery, and it's got that little bit of just that that little essence of flake. <laughs> so it's it's got it all, and it's a really great uh, kind of all-purpose dough for savory pies. If you're looking for a really easy crust for savory pies, maybe you're looking for kind of the fastest way to get pie on the table for dinner, you wanna think about some savory crumb crusts. I talk about how much I love crumb crusts in our dough and crust episode of the Pie Spectacular, but this is a great opportunity to talk about the savory options that you can use to really mix it up. I've got a crust here made out of cheese crackers. So it's, they've grinded them up, added a little bit of butter, just the same way I would if I was using something like graham crackers or other cookies. I also love to make crumb crusts like this with things like potato chips, pretzels, oyster crackers, saltines. There's really a lot you can do with kind of some of those savory items that will make a crumb crust that doesn't skew to the sweet side. I'm gonna put a quiche filling inside this cheese cracker crust and it's gonna be so good. The next crust we're gonna talk about is hot water crust. I love hot water crust because it is the definition of sturdy. It also goes against everything that you've ever come to know about the kind of pie pastry I usually talk a lot about where everything has to be really, really cold and just kind of at the perfect chilled temperature to get the best effect. This is the opposite. We're actually gonna melt the fat down. We're gonna bring the water to a boil. Everything is a little bit different with hot water crust. So I'll start by adding my fat. I've got butter. And my hot water crust recipe also uses lard. If you don't have lard or don't wanna use it, you can replace the lard with shortening. And we're gonna go ahead and melt that down. While it's melting, we can give our other ingredients a little bit of a stir. I've got all purpose flour, but I also have a little bit of bread flour. I like to use bread flour in hot water crust because it has a higher protein content and it makes for a little bit of a crisper end crust, in my opinion. It's completely fine to just use all-purpose flour to make a hot water crust, no problem at all. And of course, we need some salt. Just gonna stir those ingredients together. All right, I've got my fat melted. I'm also just gonna add my water because I want it to be really, really hot, having come to a boil. So I'm, once that mixture is all nice and hot, I'm gonna go ahead and dump it right into my flour mixture here, and we're gonna mix it until combined. One of the things that's the most different about hot water crust is that it requires being used almost immediately after mixing. This is really different than classic pie pastry, which usually needs to be refrigerated. It needs a lot of time to rest and relax. In this case, we're not worried about that. We're gonna go ahead and use it right away. Let's pour this in. It's nice and hot. And we're just gonna stir it to combine until it comes together. So one of the things I love about hot water crust is that it's really easy to handle. I actually find that my recipe can be pressed into the pan really, really easily. And that's usually what I do for a single crust pie or for the bottom crust of any pie. But for top crust effects, or if you just really would prefer to roll it out, I recommend rolling it out between two pieces of parchment paper or two pieces of plastic wrap. Either way, it'll help prevent the crust from sticking and it makes it easier to handle because 
you can pick up the actual paper to move the pastry when you need to, rather than trying to move the pastry itself. Similarly, once you get it rolled out a little bit, and you've rolled it out a few times, you can actually lift the paper up and turn the paper over and peel the paper away. This helps prevent it if it ever gets stuck to the paper. You don't have to use a bunch of excess flour. You can just keep rolling it out and using the paper kind of as this protective guide in the process. The next dough I wanna talk about is one from my cookbook, the book on pie, but it is so special. It deserves its own little moment here. It is my golden cheese pie dough. The concept of this is basically my pie dough recipe, and of course you can adjust it to use your favorite crust recipe too, and you just add a bunch of shredded cheese to it. <laughs> so a few things that this does. It obviously makes the crust taste unreal. It's delicious, it's so, so good. It also helps the crust to brown super evenly because it has this help of all of those like nice milk proteins and all of those things from the cheese going on inside the dough. Sometimes people ask me if it makes this dough more difficult to work with, but it definitely doesn't. You're just gonna add the cheese after you incorporate the fat. Things that work great for this are like Parmesan, Pecorino, sharp cheddar, Swiss, Manchego. There's really a lot, any firmer cheese that you can grate is gonna work great and make the most beautiful, most golden pie dough ever. The last dough I wanna talk about is extra special, a little bit different, and um, they're kind of hiding here. <laughs> I like to use compound butters, or butters that I've infused or added flavors to. The one that we made for you today, we made a compound butter. This recipe's from my cookbook, and of course, it's in this episode as well. This is a uh, chive compound butter. So it's made with um, chives being pureed right into the butter. We let it firm up. Then we can use this butter, cut it into cubes, and use it to make any kind of pie dough or even rough puff pastry that we want. And I've got the dough here. This is the finished dough. You can see that the dough is a beautiful green color, but holy moly is there a ton of flavor in this dough. It's just like hiding in there, where did it come from? Oh yeah, the chives, that's where it came from. The main concern when you are doing this is that you're adding additional moisture and sometimes other components, things like fiber, in the case of these chives, to the dough. That is gonna change the makeup a little bit and how the dough is to work with. So it's really important to take care to not add too much moisture or this dough can really end up being too wet and too sticky. But once you open up this world of flavored pie doughs, a lot becomes possible. Some other flavor pie doughs in my cookbook are roasted garlic, sun-dried tomato, and saffron. There's a lot that you can do and they all taste so, so amazing. this section called the crust. <laughs> Duh. Let's talk about the crust and how it pertains to savory pies. Of course, there's a lot of ways that we can bring sort of a savory element into our crust. And one place is to add some savory ingredients right from the beginning, right into the dough. I've got a few ingredients here that are some things that I like to add. Obviously, you can add things like dried spices. Other things I like to sometimes add are seeds, things like sesame seeds, nigella seeds, caraway seeds, right into the dough. It adds a lot of flavor and a little bit of texture that's beautiful too. I obviously love adding cheese. I've got some Parmesan here. Um, that's also great as sort of a garnish on the top rather than your typical uh, sugar sprinkling you might do on a sweet pie. And of course I've got some fresh herbs here. So there's really a lot of things you can add right into the crust to add a lot of flavor right from the get-go. Let's talk about par and blind baking. You know this is very important to me. The rules for par and blind baking that apply to sweet pies are still really the same with savory pies too. We're gonna par bake any single crust pie Double crust pies and free form pies typically don't require any kind of advanced oven stint, primarily because they have longer baking times, or in the case of free form pies, more direct contact with the baking sheet. Now, there's a few other crust considerations that I think are especially important when talking about savory pies. The first is deep dish. 
I think it's really important to remember that deep dish pies are significantly bigger and hold more volume of filling than a standard pie plate. We talk more about the details of this in the Pie Crust Spectacular episode, but the main takeaway is that it's going to require a longer bake time when you're using a deep dish pie plate. Remember, if you're trying to adjust a recipe for a classic pie to be a deep dish, you might even need to double the filling to make sure that you've got enough. And with more filling comes longer bake times because we need to make sure that we're getting that crust fully baked, fully golden brown so that we can pass the sturdy crust challenge. One of my favorite ways to make savory pies is to opt for a free form pie. Freeform pies are quicker and easier. They are uh, don't require things like par baking. And generally, they're just gonna get you to pie a little bit faster than when you're working with a pie plate and some of the other components. Freeform pies are really flexible and time-saving. You can usually put them right into the oven right after assembling. And also, they're really easy to determine doneness. We talked about this a little bit in past episode, but all you have to do when you want to check the doneness of your freeform pie is shake your sheet tray gently back and forth. A freeform pie that's fully baked, it's going to be sliding gently from side to side. If it doesn't move, that means it's still not baked in the very, very center. One of the types of freeform pies I love the most are miniature or any kind of tiny individual pie. It's a really great way uh, freeform pies bake so evenly and we don't have to worry about that soggy bottom business. And you don't have to worry then about having lots of tiny pans. Um, and miniature pies freeze great, refresh great. It's a great way if you're just a few people that you can enjoy savory pies without having to worry about cutting into one big one. One other thing that's important to think about when you're thinking about mini savory pies is that they're often made with puff pastry or rough puff pastry. They don't have to be, obviously. Uh, I talk a lot about how the crust can be really interchangeable and there's lots of things, but puff pastry and rough puff pastry have this structure to them that can really withstand heavier fillings. It'll kind of form around whatever your filling is. It just works especially beautifully for minis. And so I wanna point out this kind of conundrum of to dock or not to dock. A lot of pie recipes will instruct you to dock the dough with the tines of a fork. The purpose of this is to allow steam to escape from the dough during baking, and it basically helps prevent the dough from puffing up anywhere you don't want it to. So really, we're docking when we want to keep the dough flat. I bring this up because for freeform pies, it's a little bit important. Right in front of me, I have two pieces of rough puff pastry, and I made this little kind of wall of dough around the outside edge. I did this intentionally because I want the edges of these little individual pies to be thicker than the interior. So one of the things that I can do to help with that is of course make the dough taller at the edges, but I can also choose to dock the dough just where I want it to be thinner. In this case, that's just the center of these little pilots. So I'm gonna take the tines of my fork and I'm gonna press them into the center multiple times, docking just the base and choosing not to dock that exterior ring of dough. This way, in the oven, that center part, steam is gonna be able to vent through there, it's gonna stay nice and flat, but the exterior is gonna stay really nice and tall and extra puffy, which means, of course, extra flaky too. Let's talk about the fillings for savory pies, which of course can be just about anything you can dream up. The main thing to think about is the ingredient itself. Is it high in moisture? Is it going to be able to be cooked sufficiently in the amount of time that the pie is going to cook? These kinds of questions can really help you determine if you need to prepare your ingredient in advance or if it can just go into the pie raw, as is. The first thing to consider is ripeness. Right in front of me here on this paper towel lined plate, I have some beautiful in-season, super ripe heirloom tomatoes. Of course, it's great to use super ripe tomatoes like this right into a pie filling. No need to cook them or do anything. But one thing that we can do is just pat them dry a little bit. By putting them on these paper towels and letting some of that excess moisture drain out on both sides, 
when I add them into my pie later, some of that moisture isn't going to be watering down our pie filling. So this is something really mild you can do. Another example would be maybe applying a little salt to some zucchini to drain some of the moisture out of it before you add it to your pie filling. These are some things that you can do to help control your moisture level of especially really, really ripe produce without necessarily having to cook it. The next thing I wanna talk about, I've already mentioned a little bit in some of my episodes before. In culinary school, some of our instructors would say the phrase, if it looks the same, it cooks the same. So I always think it's important to be a little bit cognizant of your knife skills when you're making a savory pie. Of course, nothing has to be perfect, but if you have big chunks of bell pepper next to really skinny pieces of bell pepper, the skinny pieces are going to cook a lot faster than those big chunks. So it's just important to try to keep things even as much as possible to keep more uniform results in the final pie. In the fruit pie episode of the four part pie spectacular, I talked a lot about pre-cooking fillings because it helps to control the juiciness, which can be so unpredictable in fruit. Well, Savory produce is the exact same way. A lot of things that are really high in moisture are gonna benefit from pre-cooking to be able to concentrate that moisture, but also it goes beyond that. For example, I have these mushrooms in front of me. Mushrooms are really high in moisture, so roasting them does help to concentrate the flavor, reduce some of that moisture, but the other thing that it does is it's going to reduce the size of our mushrooms. So it's important when you're working with something like that, if we put it raw into a pie filling, when the pie comes out, the level of the filling might really be sunk way lower than we were anticipating because of all that moisture loss in the oven. But if we pre-cook these ingredients before using them in the pie filling, we are able to reduce their size a little bit, get rid of a little of that excess moisture. That way we're gonna have a more full pie at the end of the day too. These are particularly beautiful. I just have to give him some props because my husband grew these mushrooms. They're lion's mane mushrooms and they're so beautiful but they got so much smaller after roasting and we were able to concentrate their moisture so we're not watering down that pie. The other wonderful thing about pre-cooking is that it is a way to break up the process. I think a lot of people think of pie as something that has a lot of resting, chill time, downtime, but this is one way that you can kind of get something done for your filling in the days before so that when the time comes, all you're doing is assembling your pie. While we're talking about moisture, I wanna also talk about saucy components. These are the things that really bring the pie together. We don't wanna just put tomatoes in a pie or just mushrooms in a pie. We want something in there that'll just help bring the whole thing to this beautiful savory place. When I'm making sauces for savory pies, I typically make them a bit thicker than I would if I was making them for other preparations. Normally I like my tomato sauce to be nice and thin so that it can easily spread across my pizza or coat my pasta. And in this case, I've made it much thicker than I would normally make it for those preparations, specifically so that I can just control the moisture that's going on inside my savory pie. I'm not gonna have to worry about as much of that moisture cooking off inside my crust, and I'm not gonna have to worry about it making my bottom crust soggy in the process. One of the most difficult parts of pie baking for a lot of people is determining the proper doneness, making sure that that pie is baked all the way through. So let's talk about a few different things. First and foremost, especially with savory pies, the two greatest indicators that they are finished baking are gonna be an evenly golden brown crust and a bubbly or steamy interior filling. Those are always the best visual cues to look for. They're the same visual cues that we're looking for when we're making a fruit pie as well. But there's a couple of different things that we can break out with savory pies specifically. First of all, we wanna look for, when a pie is baked in the pan, we wanna look for a really even golden brown crust. You're only going to see that evenness when it has finished baking. So you can see, for example, on the edge of this pat brise crust, all the way around the outside edge, it's really the same color all the way around. In the earlier stages of baking, some parts are gonna be lighter brown and some will be darker. Those are usually a good indicator that it still needs more time because as it gets closer to being fully baked, it's going to be the same color all the way across the dough. The other indicator for pies in the pan is that the filling is either bubbling or that you can see physical steam coming out. This is more important when you're making a double crust pie like this lattice crust. We may not be able to see the filling bubbling, but we can usually see steam coming through the actual pieces of lattice or through the vents of your top crust. 
When we're working with freeform pies, it's a little bit differently. We just need to do that lovely shake test. If it's fully baked, it is going to move back and forth on your baking sheet. If it's still raw, it's gonna stay right where it is. Okay, I have some braised lamb, scallion, that'll be good. Hey Derek, where's that corn? What's that? No, that's not corn. I found it. <laughs> All right, we got leftovers. This is a leftovers PSA, okay? This is an important pie PSA. Even more important than scrap dough PSA, okay. Not more important, but just as important. <laughs> We're talking about one of my favorite creations, leftover pies. But I couldn't do a savory pie episode without talking about this because it's actually one of the things that I do the most often here in my own house to remix leftovers. If I've made a stew or a casserole or like anything that you've got really, I've already eaten it a couple of times just as it is and then I get kind of bored and I just like wish it had some flaky AF crust. <laughs> and that's when I do this. So what I did here is I went ahead and I rolled out some pie dough, just some scrap dough that I had hanging out in my freezer. I thawed it, rolled it out. You'll see that it's not par baked because it's actually in a cast iron skillet. Cast iron really conducts heat really beautifully and it's gonna drive a lot of heat to the bottom crust. So if you ever want to make a single crust pie as fast as you can without worrying about par baking, just bake it in a cast iron skillet. It's gonna do the job for you. So I have some braised lamb here that I have left over. I'm gonna go ahead and just spoon it into my crust. Ooh, it's saucy. That's okay, we want saucy. This is kind of just a great way to get from zero to pie a lot faster and with kind of skipping the step of making filling. And if you were already kind of thinking like, man, Erin, you're already talking about a lot of things I have to do in advance, like, I have to pre-cook the filling in advance, I have to do this. Well, this is a great way you can use some stuff that you've already cooked with kind of while skipping that pre-cooking step. Put some spoonfuls of charred corn. It's just some corn from the grill. And that's the other thing that's so great about leftover pies is it gives you an opportunity to think seasonally a bit too. Um, you know, you can really just say like, oh, I, only, I don't have a recipe for something really summery, but you can just kind of Make something summery with whatever you've got. I'm gonna do a bunch of scallions. I basically feel like whenever scallions are put on the top of anything, there's never enough of them. I'm like a hefty handful of scallions person. The idea of this is to keep it really simple, so I'm not even gonna crimp it. I'm just gonna kind of do what we would do with a galette and sort of fold the edges of the crust over onto itself, just kind of letting the crust fall where it may. And if it's gotten kind of hot in the process of building it, we can toss it back in the refrigerator for a little while before we bake it, or we can just go right into the oven at this point, give it some egg wash on the outer edge of the crust if you want, bake it as you would a standard pie, around 400 degrees for a flakier crust, and you know, just bake it until it gets that nice even golden brown, the same doneness indicators that we've talked about for any pie in this episode. Isn't she beautiful? No one would know she was leftovers into the oven. Okay, let's talk about the best way to store your savory pies and also options for kind of freezing them, refreshing them, saving them for later. The first thing is, I will always say that pies are best when they are fresh. Fresh baked pie is kind of a cliche for a reason because the crust is at its crispest, the filling is at its best, it hasn't had a chance to like seep into that crust at all yet. However, it is definitely possible to store your pies for later, make them ahead, you know, when the situation requires it. So the first thing is, when you're storing your pie, whenever it's possible, store the pie at room temperature. This is the best for the crust. Putting pies in the fridge will tend to make the crust sog up a little bit. Now there's ways you can refresh it and get rid of that sog. So if the filling is something that requires refrigeration, something like meat or cheese, things in that vein, you may wanna refrigerate it. Either way, cover it loosely with plastic wrap, store it at room temp or in the refrigerator until you're ready to refresh or serve. The best way if you wanna make your pies ahead and store it for a longer stretch of time, anything longer than about 24 hours, is to freeze it. 
To freeze a pie, you wanna let it cool completely. You wanna wrap it tightly in plastic wrap, and sometimes I even wrap it in two tight layers of plastic wrap, or a layer of plastic wrap and a layer of foil, just to make sure that it's really, really protected from freezer burn. When it comes to freezing your pies, you need to think about how the ingredient inside the pie is going to freeze. The crust, without fail, is usually gonna have no problem being put in the freezer, and it's gonna be no worse the wear for it as long as you refresh it properly. But some fillings don't freeze as well, or their texture can be altered as they thaw and are refreshed. So just think about that a little bit. An example of something that changes when it's frozen, for example, is cheese. It's not bad to freeze cheese, but it does usually change the texture, alter the consistency a little bit later. So just be aware of that when you're opting to freeze versus making it fresh. Freezing works especially well with mini or individual pies because you can then take out just as many as you need when it's time to eat them. I love to wrap things like this individually and then place them in a zip top freezer bag or some other kind of storage container and just pull out what I need when I need them. While the actual amount of time it can be stored in the freezer is going to vary a little bit on what's inside, on average, I recommend freezing pies, individual or large, for up to one month. Let's talk about refreshing pies. First, let's talk about refreshing pies that you baked maybe just the day before. For a whole pie, what you're gonna wanna do is tent the whole pie with foil. We do this because it's gonna help the heat kind of stay inside, and it's also going to help prevent the surface from over browning. Put the pie into your oven and set it to preheat to 375 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 190 Celsius, for those of you not using Fahrenheit. Once you put it into the oven and it starts to preheat, it's gonna sit in there while the oven is preheating, and then you wanna leave it in for about 10 minutes afterwards or until you feel like your filling is heated through to the level that you want it. The idea here is we're gradually bringing it up to temp, which allows it to heat through and allows that crust a little bit of extra time to re-crisp without taking our filling too far and cooking it further. After the 10 minutes, you wanna take the foil off the top, leave it in the oven for about five minutes, however long it takes to get it to the just right level of warmth that you want. To refresh individual portions of pie, you wanna do the same thing. You wanna wrap them tightly in foil. You can wrap them individually or kind of create a packet of multiple, depending on how you wanna handle it. You're gonna put it into the oven while it preheats up to 375 degrees Fahrenheit, 190 Celsius, and for about seven to 10 minutes afterwards. If necessary, you can open up the packet of foil and let it brown a little bit more, but be extra careful with uh, individual pies. They're gonna be extra prone to overbrowning during refreshing like this. If you have opted to freeze your pie, you wanna let it fully thaw before you try to refresh it. Allow it to thaw overnight in the refrigerator, then you can follow either of these steps, whether it's a full pie or an individual one. A lot of the mistakes that you can encounter in savory pies are really gonna be the same that you experience with all kinds of pie baking, but there are a few that are specific to this exact kind or that I didn't cover in our four-part pie spectacular that I love to talk about. <laughs> I just love to talk, that is true. <laughs> so the first one is when you're building a freeform pie and it leaks. Now, the first thing I wanna say is, if you've had this happen to you, you know this isn't really a mistake. You can still eat the pie. Really, the only thing that I like to point this out about is that when a freeform pie leaks, it can cause the bottom crust to struggle to get crisp, and you can kind of never reach that point of doneness where it moves really nicely on the sheet tray. And it can also cause areas around the edge of your crust to burn because juices and parts of the filling are kind of leaking out and they're just gonna burn on that surface area of the sheet tray. The way you avoid this is by making sure that you have enough excess crust around the outside. A lot of people I find, they just fold a tiny bit or they don't leave enough uncovered at the edge. So when they go to fold, they're only working with about a half an inch or an inch of dough. You really wanna work more with like an inch and a half to two inches. Plenty of excess so that if it does start to spread or do any of those things, it's not gonna allow the filling to escape. Another way that this can happen is if you just use too much filling in your freeform pie. 
When building a freeform pie, you generally want to keep the filling in an even single layer on the base of the crust. We're not really mounding up filling or creating a lot of height here because when we do, that's when we're going to end up having some problems possibly with bubbling over, having too much at the edges and not enough crust that we can fold over to encase it. Going right in hand with this is sogginess. I just mentioned that if it bubbles over, you're gonna have maybe the possibility for sogginess. It may not be able to bake all the way through. You're gonna wanna look for the appropriate doneness, but also just keep an eye on your filling once it starts bubbling. I made such a bad galette here. I made, I worked so hard. I didn't even seal it on this side. I didn't even fold it over. On this side, I rolled the dough too thin. And as you can see, this galette actually still looks pretty great. So the good news is that is our, our number one lesson is that even when we make mistakes, we can still have something yummy. But even with something this huge, I should normally be able to easily pick it up. And as you can see, see how the bottom is sinking inward? It's just because it leaked a little bit during baking. So it's just a little bit soggier in the center. I'm gonna lift it up as high as I can. Can you see it, Faki? <laughs> does it look brown though? Yeah, it does. But see how it's folding like a taco? It should be all one thing. And it was properly baked. It was baked for the right amount of time, but liquid from the filling came out, stayed on that bottom, and the crust has absorbed it a little bit. So still gonna be a delicious galette, but sogginess is something we wanna try to avoid. See, like just for reference sake though, for real, this is the same pie and it's properly folded. It's not sinking, no taco. It's just there, it's here, it's there. I can turn it upside down. I can do it all the things. <laughs> okay. Another way that you can avoid sogginess is to enlist the help of the baking steel or pizza stone. You wanna put this on the lower rack of your oven or wherever closest to the heat source it is, and you can just put your pie pan, whether it's on a baking sheet, in a pie plate, or even in a skillet, right on top. It's gonna to help drive a lot of heat to the bottom of the crust and help keep it really nice and brown and properly baked. If you reach the end of bake time and you suspect that your pie may have a soggy bottom, never fear, we just need to increase the bake time. It's better to bake your pie for longer than the recipe says if you want to get that crust where it needs to go. So here's how we do it. First thing, you're gonna to wanna to knock the temperature down by about 25 degrees. So say I'm baking at 400 degrees Fahrenheit, knock it down to 375 for the remainder of the bake time. If you have a pie that's browning too much in any one spot, just tent it with foil. If you're having to leave it in longer than you expect, the filling may start to brown more than you'd like. Just cover it with foil, keep going until your crust is nice and crisp. Another problem that can happen with savory pies is that the filling can shrink. We talked about this a little bit already when I was talking about why it's so wonderful to pre-cook filling ingredients sometimes. And it's not just about an unattractive look when this happens. It's also about maybe some pieces not having enough filling when you go to slice because everything kind of constricts and becomes smaller. So another way that you can avoid this when you are using raw ingredients and you're not opting to pre-cook is just make sure you pack them in really, really tightly. Get a nice even layer, tightly packed, or even overlap some of your ingredients if you're arranging them in a nice order. Prepare for the fact that as they cook, they are going to become smaller, they're going to lose moisture, and just kind of prepare for that upfront by overlapping and really packing them in so that your entire pie has plenty of filling after baking. I talked about a little bit earlier in this episode about uneven browning, and I wanna talk about that here in the mistakes happen section, specifically because it isn't always a mistake, but sometimes it is. One of the main reasons that uneven browning can happen is the dough is rolled unevenly. Um, so here we just took a piece of scrap dough and we rolled one side out super thin and then we folded the other side over onto itself so it was nice and thick. And obviously you can see that the side that was really thin in the same amount of bake time got crazy dark and the other side is still really blonde. This is a dramatic example, but this is what's happening to a lot of folks' pies. And one of the things, of course, that you can do to prevent this is use those handy dandy uh, little guide markers on the end of the Food 52 rolling pin. Um, they will get the exact even thickness, and then you're not gonna have issues like that. However, this also isn't always a mistake. So here I have this little freeform pie. This is what we did for the zucchini pies. And I just had Katie bake one without the zucchini or anything in it, just to show you this. Because we created this little pastry wall. 
Because the crust was taller, the pastry wall, the top of it, has browned more than the area below it. And of course, that makes sense. Anything that's gonna be higher is going to brown more than stuff in the kind of lower vicinity. The main reason I like to point this out is because this sometimes happens on lattice crusts, and it's not really a mistake. If the edge of your crust is taller than where the lattice is lying, or your double crust pie in any capacity, the edges might get browner than the center of your lattice. One way that you can avoid this, if you do want really even browning, is to tent your edges with foil when they get to the level of brown that you want and keep the pie in until the surface matches it. Let's talk about all the ways that you can make your pie look really, really good. <laughs> like really good. Um, of course, you wanna check out our other episodes in the Four Part Pie Spectacular because we talked about some cool tips and tricks for lots of different beautifying techniques throughout those episodes. But let's talk about some that particularly pertain to savory pies. First up on the freeform front, I've already talked a little bit about this today, that I love freeform pies for savory in particular. So of course, we've got that classic edge pleating that we've already talked about, where you can fold those edges over, pleating them artfully to make a beautiful edge that also simultaneously encases your filling. And you can see that here, we've got our ratatouille galette, and it's got a nice, beautiful edge um, that we folded over to help everything stay inside. But next to it, we have where we created walls of pastry dough. So we talked about this a little bit before. You cut a little strip of dough and also a circle. You use that strip around the outside edge of your circle. Of course, this would also work in other shapes like squares, diamonds, ovals, whatever you wanna do. And it's gonna allow the edges to rise a little bit taller, leaving the center a little bit flatter, perfect for putting all your filling inside. While we're talking about these freeform pies, let's also think a little bit about how we arrange our filling. Um, I put this in my little outline for Bake It Up A Notch as artful arrangements, because that's how I always think about it. Just taking a few minutes to really arrange your vegetables, your bacon, your sausage, your whatever your filling is in like a really attractive eye-catching way. Uh, in this case, I just arranged all of those vegetables in kind of concentric circles or sort of a spiral from the center moving outward. And it made this really, really lovely cornucopia vegetable sort of look, which I really love. The last thing I want to talk about that I think especially works with savory pies is adding flavorful finishes to your pies. One of the ways that I love to do this is a little out of the box. I like to serve savory pies like this. Almost any of these pies that I would make, I would make a really big salad to serve alongside it. Because we've got a lot of richness, we've got that flakiness. So just something that's gonna cut that, some freshness, I love that. So sometimes I get real crazy and I just make a salad and I put it right on top of the pie before I serve it. And that's what I'm gonna do today with one of my favorite pies from my cookbook. This is my sesame lamb pie. It's a really delicious, flavorful braised lamb pie and I love to pair it with like a really bright smashed cucumber salad. So this salad has been kind of marinating in my fridge for a little bit. And I'm just gonna spoon it right on top so that when we serve this pie, of course you could just spoon it right alongside, let everybody have it. But it takes this pie that is a delicious but very brown pie and it brings some freshness into the game. It brings some green, some, you know, deliciousness. So I'm gonna add that and I'm gonna also add some toasted sesame seeds to the top of it because it's my sesame lamb pie and sesame, more sesame seeds are a great idea. So I love something like that, just piling it right on top. But let's move that aside and try one other. Another thing that I like to do is just blind bake a crust and then put delicious toppings on it. This particular pie was inspired by a, an everything bagel. Um, and it was actually Katie's brilliant idea, my wonderful assistant Katie. It was her idea that it should have a hole in the center just like a real bagel. But of course you could just bake it as a circle. And I've got a mixture that I made here that's whipped cream cheese, capers, lemon zest, and then I have a bunch of toppings like what I would put on a bagel. I've got red onion and scallion and um, dill and some sliced tomato. So we're just gonna go ahead and sort of build this pie with a fully baked pie crust, just putting everything on top. Whenever you do something like this, it's really important that you put it all together, assemble it right before you're ready to serve.
However you decide to make your pie look pretty, there are tons of creative ways that are also really delicious to make your pie look like a million bucks. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Bake It Up A Notch, where we talked about all things savory pies. These are pies that you're gonna wanna be eating for lunch, dinner, heck, even at breakfast time, because we've got ourselves a bagel pie right here. Of course, all of these delicious recipes can be found on Food52. They are linked in the video description below. If this inspires you to get baking, please, please tag me, tag Food52, and use hashtag Bake It Up A Notch. We wanna see what you're baking up. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like and subscribe so you can be made aware of all our new episodes as they become available. I cannot wait to dive into all of these delicious savory pies. We've got our roasted tomato and gooey cheese. We've got a deep dish chicken pot pie. We have our zucchini pilots, our little mini individual pies. We have our sesame lamb pie doused in cucumber salad, just absolutely buried in it. We have a BLT quiche in a cheese cracker crumb crust. We have a really yummy hot water crust pie with curried vegetables inside. I love this pie. Our everything bagel pie, and of course, our summer, end of summer perfect celebration, this ratatouille galette. I loved this episode. I loved baking it with you. I can't wait to see your savory pies. And as always, until next time, happy baking. <laughs>